Starstruck. In 1987, a cartoon premiered based off a comic book that was printed three years earlier, featuring a family of four brothers who all happen to be ninjas as well as mutant turtles. What kind of insanity is this? Who would want to read about something so asinine? Well, apparently quite a lot of people, because the turtles turned into a pop culture phenomenon that is still going strong today, even if it's not as strong as it was in the mid to late 1980s. Along with the cartoon, action figures, and comic came video games. And on the NES, the first among them was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, developed by Ultra Games, which was in fact the public company of Konami. At the time, Nintendo imposed strict limits on how many games the publisher could release on the system, and the way Konami avoided this was to create another company that was only another company in name only. So already, this game has a good libertarian head start going for it. As you may already know, all the kids are talking about how hip these Ninja Turtles are, and are hotly debating which one of them is the best. Leonardo with his katana blades, Raphael with his sai, Michelangelo with his nunchucks, or Donatello with his bow staff. The nice thing about this Ninja Turtles game is that it lets you play as any one of the four teens, and you can switch between them at will. And unlike some socialist utopia, where all the turtles are forced into being equal and stripping away their own unique abilities, here they each do play differently. Leonardo is the most balanced turtle in that his katana attacks travel in a nice arc that can hit enemies on the ground or directly in front of him with decent range and attack speed. Michelangelo has a similar attack range and strength, but Leo's down and up thrusts are far superior. Then there's Donatello. His bow has the highest attack power and the longest range, but his attack can be slower and sometimes can go over the heads of enemies on the ground, leaving him a bit more vulnerable than he needs to be. And as for Raphael, he's just awful. Raphael's the turtle you play as when the rest of the team are dead. Raphael's the turtle you pick when you hate yourself. Raphael's the turtle you pick when you hate your friend who's never played the game before, and you give him the controller and tell him this is the only character you can play as. All Raphael has is his side, which interestingly enough in real life is meant to be used more as a defensive melee weapon as opposed to an offensive one. So even though you're given the freedom to pick whatever turtle you choose, you could make the argument that the game's developers were only giving you the illusion of freedom, and instead forcing you to pick either Leonardo or Donatello for most of the game. The other two are less Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and more Teenage Mutant Ninja Meat Shields, the characters you pick when you just don't want Leo and Donnie to get hurt. Either way, the two good Ninja Turtles and the two disappointments have to travel through six different levels to at first rescue April O'Neil, then save a dam from blowing up, then rescue their master Splinter, and finally try to get a cure from the evil Shredder that will turn Splinter back into a human. Six levels doesn't seem like an awful lot, but quite a few of these places are pretty massive in scope, allowing you to go down different paths, explore different buildings, and essentially just waste a lot of your time in dead ends. One thing you can say about this game is that the libertarian roots show in how the turtles are able to wield their weapon of choice on the city streets of Stage 1, and even drive around a turtle van that's equipped with a machine gun and ballistic missiles in the maze-like city setting of Stage 3. Considering this game takes place in New York, I think it's safe to assume that this version of the Big Apple has crime down to a minimum. I mean, it would, if you ignore the roving Foot Clan ninjas and ninja steamrollers running down people in the streets. But aside from that, crime is down at least 89% according to the Cato Institute. After completing the first level and having to fight the mini-boss of Bebop and the actual boss of Rocksteady, the turtles make their way to the dam, and suddenly the game quickly escalates in difficulty. Waves of enemies start coming at you, and some of the platforming is so ridiculously tight because of the short building height. It's easy to miss the jump that helps you get to the dam's damn roof, because the damn damn ceiling is too damn low for the damn dam. The turtles are then required to swim underwater, disabling a series of bombs that threaten to blow the dam apart. A lot of people complained about how difficult this section was back when it was released, and though it can be a challenge, it's not actually that hard if you're careful, don't stop moving, and remember to switch turtles when they take too much damage. What the game doesn't tell you, though, is that none of this would have happened if the dam had been privatized instead of being a government public works project. Maybe then they could have afforded some additional security that could have been used to protect the dam from being overrun by ninjas, interdimensional creatures, and people who are really adept at swimming and deep-sea bomb planting. The difficulty in Stage 3 comes from the maze of a city you have to run through, and less from the Mecha Turtle boss that you have to fight at the end of it. Between all the buildings and various pathways you have to travel down, it can be hard to locate where you have to go, and the game doesn't give you any help getting there. This, of course, is fine, because people shouldn't be entitled to handouts like maps. What do you think this is? 
That taxpayer money could be going to more important things, like the well-maintained roads you're driving the turtle van on. Stage 4 ramps up the difficulty even further by putting you on some sort of military base, where the only way of advancing is by going through a series of underground passageways littered with lava, giant magnets, spiked walls, and other things that would create massive OSHA violations. Fortunately, OSHA doesn't seem to exist here, scoring one more big point for this game's libertarian themes and helping to put yet another nail in the coffin of big government regulatory agencies. The end boss of a giant mouser suggests that private military funding has been going toward black ops projects that may be co-financed by Shredder. And I for one welcome this extra source of revenue, as it's military projects like this that eventually lead to developments in technology that advance our everyday lives. Stage 5 brings you to the Foot Clan base, where in the tunnels underneath, Shredder's Technodrome lies in wait. Though in what is probably one of the more unfair elements of this game, there are three random locations it could appear in, and there's no way for you to control which area it's going to be. Well, there is, but it requires knowing the game's code and realizing that the frame on which you press start to begin the game also sets the location at which the Technodrome will appear. Finally, the last stage itself puts you in the Technodrome to set you against the heaviest damage-dealing enemies in the entire game, including a bunch of spacemen with lasers? Maybe Shredder got them from NASA in exchange for all that weapons funding? Either way, I strongly support this, as these contracts are just securing more money for government works, but not in a way that affects your pocketbook or mine. In fact, I think we should outsource more of our resources to the Shredder. It's not like he's trying for world domination in this game, he just wants to kill a bunch of mutant turtles. How is that any different than the US trying to eliminate Asian carp from the Great Lakes? It's really just protecting the environment from foreign elements that could damage the ecosystem. Now Shredder is doing it, and willing to pay us for the help, then why not pitch in? It's a win-win scenario. But as you know, I'm also a consumer advocate. My time working with Hugh Downs on 2020 taught me that you can learn a lot from incredibly old people. So when I had Hugh sit down to play this game, and he stared back at me in bewildering confusion, that's when I realized this game might have some problems. For starters, this is not an easy game. In fact, the levels can get so infuriatingly difficult that you may not even want to continue playing past level 2 or 3. The action is non-stop, though, even if the enemies you're facing seem to not make much sense in a Turtles game. Oddly enough, there are different sets of enemies that can appear from area to area. Sometimes you might get the ninja set, so to say, and face off against purple Foot Clan soldiers and giant evil bees. Other times you might get this weird on-fire guy or some dude with a chainsaw or these eyeballs with legs or a giant frog, and granted I'm not as hip or cool or rad as the kids today, but I think I've seen enough Ninja Turtles to know that these things didn't show up in any episode. Like in another Konami game, Castlevania, you can pick up sub-weapons to help you out, and also just like in classic Castlevania games, these can appear randomly. If you pick up an item while already holding one, it will eliminate the previous item from your inventory. So if you happen to come across the valuable scroll items, only to pick up a lousy boomerang later, you can say goodbye to those scrolls forever. It's also worth mentioning that the control in this game can be a little hard to handle. The turtles can jump in one of three ways, either in a short hop, a medium jump, or a giant spinning leap, based on how long you hold on the jump button for. And there are some sections of this game where your jumping skills need to be right on point, otherwise you're going to end up with more dead turtles in a government-run pet shop. But despite all these flaws, this Ninja Turtle game is unique in that it's one of the very few games to not be a side-scrolling beat-em-up, as well as one of the few that allows you to change between all four turtles at will. This side-scrolling platforming in action isn't as satisfying and precise as, say, Ninja Gaiden, Castlevania, or Mega Man, but it's not bad either. It's challenging, but no more so than any game on that list that I just mentioned. And in some ways, it's not as unfairly difficult either, especially once you know where you're going in the levels themselves. So yeah, in many ways, this game actually holds up pretty well as a challenging retro-platforming action game. And if that wasn't enough, it also sports an incredibly memorable soundtrack. Some of the songs are reused a bit too much, but the overworld theme from level 1, the boss battle music, and some of the interior building tunes are very catchy and suit the action well. The bigger question, though, is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles libertarian? Well, considering the amount of weaponry at your disposal, the freedom to switch between two great turtles and two meat shields, and the government outsourcing funds to and contracting work from the Shredder, yes, Ninja Turtles is very much libertarian. But hey, I'm not a mutant reptile trained in ninjutsu, so what do I know? Give me a break.